So what we had a couple of times is where um, there's a customer ask and it's about, um, hey, we want to make sure that we don't have any vulnerabilities in our production environment. Great, <laughs> like GitLab should help you do that. Can you please make sure that as soon as there's a vulnerability, people cannot deploy the code on uh, their production environment? I'm like, oh, that's, that's a very different thing. And it's important to realize they're two completely different things. For example, um, you might have um, false positives. Like there might be, our tooling might be broken. And there might be something that, um, um, that causes it. Um, to detect a vulnerability when there's really not, no vulnerability. It might also be that you're not making the situation worse. Suppose you have a library now that has a hundred or two known vulnerabilities and you're, you're changing something else not related to that and now it will block you from doing that. So there's a difference between kind of the vulnerabilities and increasing vulnerabilities. Might also be a case we use a library, let's say for regular expressions, and there's like an attack in the wild that you've heard about, like all the mailing lists are red hot because hackers are exploiting this and you're replacing it for another library. And this is fresh, fresh news. Um, like the vulnerability is not even assigned a CVE number yet. Or maybe it is, and there was a known vulnerability. And the new library you want to use has even more known vulnerabilities, this is five of them, but the risk is way lower to the organization. So it's still the right action to kind of do that. I've, um, I've seen occasions where a website was down and then uh, the f was taken down because of a vulnerability in the software. And after updating the vulnerability, the QA test had to run. But at that point, the, the website was down, like nobody could use it. The, the, the usage of the site was zero. Like, like, they, like it was unusable because it was down. And still they were testing for like, does it work well with color blindness, even though the front end didn't change. Um, you, we gotta make sure that, that stuff, that, that we empower organizations. Um, for example, you could say, hey, every time I deploy, I want to make sure that, I don't know, I update my asset library because I, I want to do that. We take the power away from developers to, to, make, to make a choice there. You get into really start, tricky stuff. Like what if you need to update your website, but also your asset management repository is down or that service is down. You can, the, the more dependencies you introduce, the, the worse things get. And what you quickly get is that people start working around it. And that's what we've seen with security software. Before GitLab introduced security software, there's many, many, many companies that introduced security software and they integrated with your DevOps pipeline and they did what customers asked. If it makes things worse, don't deploy it. And what you saw is that everyone started working around it and there was just a low compliance. And that's what I really want to prevent us from doing. So every time we get the request like, hey, make sure that X, Y, Z always happens, we should understand what's behind that request. And we should make sure that, we're, uh, that we do the best thing. We don't necessarily do what the customer asks for, but we do what the customer, what, what most, what's the best solution for most of our customers. Because some, some things are easy to configure in a way that uh, will require people to work around the tool. And that's, that's when we've lost. Like as soon as people start working around GitLab, we have a problem. And in almost all cases I've seen, the best solution was give people a dashboard, like warn them, still allow them to override, but give, the pe give people a dashboard, like make it visible throughout the organization what the status is 
of, of things. So that's why I want this conversation. I saw, I've seen a couple of requests like, hey, we really need to enforce X, Y, Z. I've given into it. Uh, we had a major financial institution that asked for, hey, let's, let us do that. And it turned out that the end goal was compliance. Great, we're adding compliance management in GitLab. We're gonna do a great job of it. And it's gonna allow them to do a lot less themselves. So most of these times, the, the, the CI jobs people are asking for are workaround for some other need they have. So I'd love to discuss those needs because I've looked through the issue and all I could find was they need to run the CI job in the sentence. So the, the question is like, why do they need to run the CI job? And let's figure that out and let's solve the, the underlying problem because enforcing that CI job might have a ton of unforeseen consequences. And it's almost a thing that we might not never want to ship in GitLab because um, it's an easy thing to turn on for one person, but there might be hundreds of people suffering throughout the organization because of it and people might start hating our tool. Yeah, those are all really valid points. Thank you for uh, detailing that. The, I think what might be helpful is to your point, looking at why customers are asking us for these kind of enforced jobs. And it does ultimately come down to a compliance posture of some sort. Uh, the customer that you referred to, the, the financial one, by their own admission, there are some jobs that they could extract out of the pipeline and they could run those, I believe they described them as kind of slow and complex, but those could be pulled out of the pipeline using uh, another issue we have that's to enable customers to add API endpoints that they could then pull to get some feedback from that system. And for them, that was an acceptable solution for part of the equation. But the other part of the equation was there seems to be some stuff that still has to run as a requirement for that process. And that doesn't seem to be budging. Um, my understanding is it's tied into uh, one of the bigger items is scans. Um, the scans are external, whether they're proprietary or just existing sophisticated systems, they're external and they want, the customer wants those to be included uh, as part of that process. Uh, some of the other valid points brought up were things like versioning, um, uh, uh, generating reports or documentation as a part of that deploy. Now those, that, at least that latter one sounds like it could be pulled out of the pipeline, but still trying to find that balance of what has to be part of that and what can we articulate to pull out of in some other way. Yeah, so making reports, that sounds like something we should solve with compliance in GitLab. So I think that sounds like something we should add to, the, um, to GitLab. Regarding the scans, what, um, what I see, and I, I realize I'm not talking to the security testing team here. Um, what GitLab has is like, hey, here are the projects with lo uh, low vulnerabilities, medium vulnerabilities, high vulnerabilities. There's something missing there. And what is missing there is here's the projects that didn't get scanned in the first place. That's even worse than a high vulnerability because it's a high vulnerability that no one's seen. So that should be front and center and right now it, it's not. So that should be in our security sense. The second thing with our security scans, they give you a count. How many security vulnerabilities do you have? That is not as actionable as giving. This is how long these security vulnerabilities existed in the product. If you have to choose which one you show, you should choose how fast do you respond. I can tell you if you have a help desk at a company, if you say, well, we got a thousand phone calls a day. I don't know. You say, hey, I solve people their cases in an hour versus a day. That gives you an idea of how good that help desk is. Doesn't say everything, of course not. But it's, you will have things you have to remedy. It's all about with the speed with which you do that. The companies that get hacked, it's not because one had zero vulnerabilities and the other one had a thousand. It's because what is the speed to remediation? The best hacker one or book, uh, uh, book crowd programs are not the ones that find zero vulnerabilities. The best ones are that solve it quickly. So we should show how fast they're solved. So that's regarding the security scans. We have functionality for this. 
we should make sure that the customer is able to plug those scanners in and we show the security posture. And if the, the scans didn't happen, that should be higher than the highest priority. That, that is a, a really bad thing. But it does not the same as blocking a release because if your external security scanner is down and the market is failing and you need to deploy something, if not deploying for 30 minutes can wreck companies. So in the end, uh, most of the things are a people game and it should never be the computer over people. It can be a two person rule where two people have to sign off on something. I can, I can see cases for that. We have that, but uh, let's, the, the, we can't give in to, um, to a simplistic way of thinking about this because then we'll make, we'll, we'll, will end up exactly as all the other DevSecOps tools. And we go into any company and we ask, okay, you got the DevSecOps tool. What percentage of products do they run at? And for almost all customers, it's less than 10% of the projects. That's how we'll end up as GitLab if we do things like this. So one of the questions that comes to mind is uh, in situations where customers are using their own scanners um, outside of GitLab, but they want that to be a requirement as part of this process. Um, how do you view that particular challenge? Yeah, that makes total sense. Like we already have GitLab scans and we should add functionality. Like if the scan didn't run, that's the worst thing. It's worse than high priority items. And they should be able to say, well, I don't only want these GitLab scans to run. I also want my, this other scan to run. And we should put that on the same footing um, I think it's an ultimate feature to add external fans, scans, but that should be, uh, we should allow for that. And, and so my, my understanding to this point is that, um, you know, let's say that we add this ultimate feature that allows for the uh, incorporation of these external scanners or, or scans rather. Um, if a customer says, I want to add this, is do you envision that this is still a reporting only thing where I've added my external scan this job occurs for each pipeline and I have an output in let's say the security dashboard and that's kind of the end of it. Like we're, we're still moving away from this enforcing that scan in some way. No, please enforce it. Send emails to people, give alerts, alert pager duty, reduce people's bonuses, whatever you have to do, but blocking a deploy to production is probably not the answer. What, what, I'm sorry, did I hear someone else? No, sorry, I was going to jump in there real quick, just, um, and, and, and thanks so much. Are you saying um, don't, don't block the deploy to production, but if it, if it requires, like for compliance, I mean, for, for regulation purposes, it requires this, you know, particular, this has to run for auditing purposes. We have to be able to show that it ran X, Y, Z. Um, you still envision almost blocking. Every, almost every auditing thing will have a, Yes, but there's, there's a manual over, there's an overwrite that is possible. So maybe you need an extra sign off, just like we need one more approval. I don't think any auditor will sign off on like, look, if this tool is down, you cannot deploy to production. That would be foolish. There are companies in the financial sector that didn't have their CD pipeline in order that went broke in 30 minutes because they couldn't replace the code they, they deployed that was full of errors. We can never have, GitLab is the solution to that. And I refuse to enter into a possibility that GitLab would be the cause of that. Yeah, I, th I think that's totally fair. Um... And I agree with the sentiment. I, I'm, I guess I'm still trying to figure out because if, if a company says, hey, here's what we do. And one of those things is we scan every change that uh, is made to production. If they're kind of to Dave's point, if there are gaps in that process and the auditor says, why, why was the scan not performed in this particular merge request? It's like, well, because we don't have the ability to 
force that for every merge request. No, so then, we, can, we can have the possibility that someone signs off on that and you have to show who signed off on that. In the end, the human has to be in control, but it can be a comply or explain thing. But we better show the auditor who signed off on it, on what moment, based on what, for what reason. So, so still at the merge request level, I have somebody, there still has to be an approval of some sort, some override of some sort uh, sure. at that level. Yeah. But a warning is something completely different than an enforcement. So that's why I object to the word enforcement. And it can be like, hey, whoa, whoa, what you're doing. What you're doing now is no longer something you can decide on your own. We need your approval that you've seen this warning and you need someone else in this specific group of people to sign off on this. I'm not against that. I think it should be a last resort to make something like that. And, and the bigger thing I'm saying is, look, these, these people, are, they made their own solution to this problem because it wasn't in GitLab. So understand their need and address that with GitLab. So you need to run a CI job to make a report, figure out what's in that report and why it's not in GitLab already. They're paying us to solve their compliance problems. We should solve it for them. Yeah, I think that some of the requirements, we've done exactly that. Things like the reporting, um, things like uh, sending some data payload to them to be able to automate change management processes. Like those are things that we can't address outside of this kind of required pipeline concept. Um, there, I, I still have some reservations, but. So, so I don't, I don't like the wording. Like it's required pipeline. It's not a required pipeline. It's a re required reporting or it's a required scan that needs to happen. So that's fair. So the, the, the reason they're asking for pipelines is because that's how they do it now. So we need to change how we talk about these things. And we cannot, it cannot be like, oh, I asked a customer, asked them whether they really needed this. And they said, yeah, they really need this. That's not a fruitful conversation. You really have to dive in and think, why do you need this? How are you solving today? What are the audit requirements? If we don't end up talking to their auditors at some point, we're doing it wrong. Yeah, I think those are all valid points. Um, I, I think it's definitely worth, uh, and there's still some work to be done digging into the parts of the requirements that they have as far as those specific scans or reports and in those types of functions. Um, I'm confident that we'll be able to, uh, to solve half or part, right, part of those requirements, but it's that other half that it sounds like we need to do some additional digging on. Yeah, and our goal should be fix them all. Like they're, they're paying us to reduce the complexity. So that's what we should be doing. Time so we Oh, yes, okay. Uh, so I guess we'll go ahead and close this out, Sid, I believe, at uh, 325 or five to